I want to talk to black people across this country. There are four things we have to do. Number one, we have to stop being ashamed of being black. We've got to stop being ashamed of being black. Number two, we have to move into a position where we can define terms for what we want them to be, not what racist white society wants it to be. We have to move to define. We have to move to a position where we can feel strength and unity amongst each other from Watts to Harlem, where we won't ever be afraid. And the last thing we have to do is to build a power base so strong in this country that we'll bring them to their knees every time they mess with us. Good evening, brothers and sisters. Welcome again to Seoul. Tonight on this edition of Seoul, which we have entitled Wherever We May Be, we reflect on the contributions and attitudes of the legendary activist and organizer, Brother Stokely Carmichael. Your host for this evening's program is the producer of Seoul, Ellis Hazlett. Thank you, Jerry B. And I'd like to welcome you, our viewing audience, to this evening's rap session with our brother Stokely Carmichael, who has returned to these shores. And I'd like to welcome you, uh, should I say home, Stokely? No, sir, home is in Africa. You can welcome me back to America. Well, it's very good to have you back with us. Uh, how's, how do you feel being back? Well, there's a lot of work to be done. I feel the same as always, except that uh, things are a lot brighter now. The consciousness of our people are a lot higher than they were, and thus the opportunity for organizing is at a premium. You're responsible for a lot of that. Um, since your activity with SNCC, which was Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, um, and the use of the word black power, which history, of course, will decide you know, what that represents in American history, and I think in the history of all African peoples. Tonight's episode, Stokely, we entitled uh, Wherever We May Be, and the finish of that sentence is that we are an African peoples. And uh, a lot has gone down, but I thought it would be nice if for our sole audience we could chat with you and sort of uh, establish some things that will be here on videotape and for people to use throughout. And so that maybe we might begin with uh, where you were born. You were born in... I was born in Trinidad in 1941. In Port of Spain. In Port of Spain, Trinidad. Have you been back since uh, you came to the United States? No, I cannot return to Trinidad. The government of Trinidad has uh, deemed me and uh, some, I don't, what is it, uh, person in non gratis, someone who's not welcome back. That's a lot of dues <coughs> to pay in your home. And there's a lot of awareness <coughs> going in Trinidad. A whole lot. Yeah. A whole lot. And, uh, <laughs> they can't stop it. They try, but they can't <laughs> in stop In the it. Caribbean, and I'm certain. Uh, that well are you traveling now as an american citizen or well i have a um guinean i have guinean citizenship also i have uh, both citizenship i have a um a guinean passport which is a junior diplomatic passport uh, our brothers and sisters of guinea uh, gave me the passport but i think it's just a representative it's just symbolic of uh, what they know that brothers and sisters who are born outside of the continent are in fact african and have a a very vital role to play in the development of uh, the African Revolution all over the world, and certainly that we are African and belong to the African continent. Mm -hmm. That's uh, something, uh, is it, uh, that's called dual citizenship. Well, it is, but uh, actually and technically, you see, while we are American citizens, we, I usually say that we have American papers, we're not really citizens. And as uh, Brother Malcolm said, you, either you are or you're not, and certainly we're not, but uh, I guess on the legalistic terms, you would say dual citizenship in that I, I do have Guinean citizenship and uh, participate fully in all of the, all, all of the uh, political, uh, cultural, and social uh, happenings in Guinea. Stokely, uh, a lot of us became very aware of you during a period in this country, I guess it was in the early 60s, when uh, the civil rights movement was uh, creating such an effect on people's lives here. And uh, you became a uh, member of SNCC, SNCC. And uh, why don't you run down a little to us what it was like being involved in that period of American history? Uh, African history. African history. In America, albeit. Yes. Um, I, um, 
I think that uh, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, beyond the shadow of a doubt, was the vanguard movement in the United States in the 60s. Um, when I say it was the vanguard movement, I do not deny the role of Dr. King. Dr. King certainly played perhaps the most important role in the terms of being the center of that movement, but uh, SNCC was indeed the vanguard movement in that it was always in front, pushing, uh, breaking new ground, and uh, raising new levels of consciousness for our people. I don't think that uh, <clears throat> enough people really get a, a clear history and understanding of SNCC. I think that uh, if we understood SNCC, we would really appreciate it more. You know, we had, uh, for example, our salaries uh, in SNCC were $9.98 per week. And uh, that meant that, uh, say, if I was working in Mississippi, I couldn't really live on $9.98 per week. So I had to live with the people with whom I work. Uh, thus, I had to sleep on their floors, eat with them. And uh, I couldn't stay at the same family all the time because I'd become a burden mm -hmm. to these people because we're talking now about uh, peasants, sharecroppers so that we were forced constantly to move around. You were forced to organize. And uh, for our own protection, we had to broaden our base because uh, I mean, many of us were killed. Uh, there was constant harassment. Uh, there was constant uh, violence perpetrated against us. Uh, I think that uh, these, these things don't really come out. The beauty, the beauty of SNCC, the, the commitment of people who um, had the opportunity to move up in the society very easily but rather than accept that, they decided to work uh, for their people, to try and to organize their people, and to give their people a sense of power, a sense of power. Uh, of course, I think a lot of people don't really understand the issues of SNCC. They say that uh, SNCC was nonviolent. I find a, a lot of people try to dis dis dismiss the history of our struggle. And uh, of course, they try to do that with the 60s. And many of them, I think, is because they didn't participate Mm -hmm. in that history. And because they didn't participate, they just dismiss it. Like I find people all the time say, well, SNCC was just nonviolent. Uh, they weren't doing nothing. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't let nobody hit me upside my head. Well, you know, if you wouldn't let anybody hit you upside your head in 1960, you could have gone and, you know, did something else. You didn't have to, you know, that's what we felt was the important tactical way to achieve the goals we were aiming at. And history has proven that it was the correct tactic at that time to, in fact, take a nonviolent tactical approach in order to build the contradictions and to heighten the consciousness of our people. Uh, I think now, tactically, for SNCC, nonviolence was just a tactic. Inside of the organization, I, I don't think you had people who held to nonviolence mm -hmm. even as a way of life. It was merely a tactic. Uh, and for many, many SNCC people, I guess we can say this now, I know as early as 1962, many SNCC people were carrying guns. I mean, we carried guns and we kept them. And the policy was clear. On public demonstrations or in public statements, we would take nonviolent attitude, but uh, on the back roads of Mississippi, if I'm organizing at night and some white boy tried to shoot me, it's he or me, you know. And that was very clear, very clear. There were many of us who carried guns uh, in those early days. You first lived and worked in Mississippi. Uh, you went from New York to live and work in Mississippi, and then you moved on to Alabama. Is that correct? Correct. Uh, why did you move from Mississippi to Alabama? Well, you know, as I started, my first trip into Mississippi was with the Freedom Rides. <laughs> That makes me feel old. Let me see. That's uh, that's 13 years ago, isn't yes. it? Yes. <laughs> A lot of buses moved <laughs> yeah. along those roads since then. And uh, of course, after the Freedom Rides, we had a discussion, and uh, SNCC decided that it would be Stokely, more. Stokely, could you just because uh, Seoul is very fortunate, we have quite a few uh, people who are young, and Freedom Rides means something to you and me, and a lot of them don't quite understand <laughs> what a Freedom Ride was in the early 60s. Well, in uh, the early 60s, as uh, of course, you would remember, and I think that uh, any young person, any young African who is watching this show and does not understand the uh, Freedom Ride movement has a responsibility to go to their teachers and demand that their teachers explain that to them because it is their history and they must understand their history. But uh, of course, in the 1960s, uh, black people could not ride the buses uh, up front in the South. and. Uh, a program was waged by the Congress of Racial Equality that was that time under the leadership of Mr. James Farmer to take buses and ride through the South and go into uh, bus terminals which were segregated and move into the white terminals. And uh, they had decided to go to Mississippi. Now on the first bus it went, uh, which had such people as of course uh, John Lewis, uh, Hank Thomas, uh, uh, the, that bus was burnt in uh, Birmingham and mm -hmm. there were beatings and uh, then there was a discussion whether or not to carry on the bus rides. And some of us felt that it couldn't stop. We had to carry it on. And then 
we decided that we should take it right to the heart of where the struggle was, which was, of course, Mississippi. Uh, of course, we, we rode in and uh, we were arrested, uh, uh, regular beaten harassments, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, our objective was to continue the pressure on the state of Mississippi, just keep continuing until it was forced to uh, readjust its policies. Uh, when we got out of jail, uh, many of us decided that uh, maybe we should seek organizing, building strong power bases, and thus using the vote as a tool, using the vote as a means, not mm -hmm. as an end. Because a lot of people also become quite confused with that, especially today with many uh, black, quote, congressmen and black, quote, congresswomen in office. They seem to think is this, this was what we were working for. But we've always just seen the vote as a means, as a tool for organizing our people and not as an end. Uh, thus, we began to organize in Mississippi, and we organized then our first attempt was the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, which was, in essence, a, a third party. It was a party of all black people, because white people in Mississippi at that time would, wouldn't even think of, of sitting down together. And the party, the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, from which came such great people as Mrs. Fannie Lou Hamer, uh, Mrs. Devine, of course, they're fantastic. I mean... Uh, the, the energy that we were able to, to break loose in the uh, sharecropper, in the sharecroppers that we work with and just push them out front and begin to motivate them and move them and organize. It was, uh, I think it's one of the most exciting experiences. Well, I couldn't say that, but it's certainly a very exciting part of my life, one that I could not forget. Well, for a lot of people, it's also so exciting because it was uh, a chance when people could sit in their homes, whether they were active or not, and watch you and the members of SNCC and other um, organizations creating an atmosphere of positiveness because there were so many moral victories. I mean, the desegregation of the buses and the election of a um, congressman, I think, by the uh, Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party and all. But um, it was also a time of uh, great emotional stress through the killings and and the beatings and all. It was. Now, I think that uh, through SNCC, we lost close to 17 people. I mean, it's, it may not sound like a lot, but as a close organization, you know, if you have an organization of, say, about uh, 300 people and you know everybody and you lose uh, 17, you, each time one goes, you feel it, especially since you're right there, you may be the next one. Uh, the emotional stress was, of course, very great, but uh, the thing that kept us going, of course, was our inner strength, our deep inner strength, and more than that, I think our, our undying love for our people, but more important was the reality that we knew that nothing could stop us. We would win. We would win because we had a just struggle. What do you think of Dr. King's relationship to, to the movement during that time and his role uh, internationally in assisting uh, in the struggle? Well, history will have, has already given Dr. King his proper due and will continue to do so. Dr. King, I have a great deal of respect and admin, admin, admiration for uh, Dr. King. I always will. I had the opportunity to work with him. I had the opportunity to walk side by side with him. I find a lot of people today who say, oh, he was nonviolent, he was this. But the fact is that he took his theoretical base and put it into practice. He believed in nonviolence as a way of life, and he was in the streets. There's mm -hmm. those who condemn him. If they didn't take their theory at the time while he was in the streets and put their theory into practice, they have no right none whatsoever, none whatsoever to condemn him. All they can do is take their hats off to him and say, well, that's what he believed in. At least he put it into action. Maybe I believed in violence or whatever, but I just believed in it. I didn't make it concrete. Dr. King made it concrete. Dr. King's, I think he has two great, really great contributions to make to our history. One is Dr. King was a great mobilizer. He could mobilize. Hey, man, I I've seen him work. He's really, he could work, you know, he could really work. And uh, he's still uh, capable of doing that on records hey, with a can, voice only. Hey, he can today. speak. Yeah. Woo, he, he's an orator. I mean, <laughs> history has to record him as one yeah. of the great orators of this century, yeah. beyond the shadow of a doubt. He could mobilize. I mean, I could see him come into a town and just begin to have mass meetings and mobilize, and people just begin to get up and run and move. And they loved him. They loved him. I would see old people just reaching over to touch the hem of his, actually saying, let me just touch the hem of his coat. And I'd seen some old ladies just touch him, and she said, oh, Lord, I done touch him. I done touch him. Lordy, Lordy, I done touch the doctor. I touched Dr. King. I mean, and for her, life meant she lived. She mm -hmm. had lived. Uh, he was a mobilizer. He taught us how to confront. Dr. King taught us how to confront. He would always size up the whole situation and decide how to confront. But he was never afraid of confrontation. Sometimes I would have disagreements. 
in terms of tactics, but Dr. King taught us how to confront. He went wherever the trouble was, and he said, this is the point, this is the time, let us confront. And he would be there. He would be there. He wouldn't be off somewhere talking. He would be there. Uh, I think those two contributions we must remember. Of course, uh, on an overall international basis, his contribution of morality, of the deep inner dignity and worth of a human being can never be overridden. Mm -hmm. I mean, that his constant appeal for the moral conscience of a nation to wake up, his deep belief in the inner dignity and worth of a human being. Uh, these things, uh, of course, moved me and had a great deal of effect upon me, especially because I was constantly with him, mm -hmm. constantly watching him work, although we worked in different organizations. Uh, organizations notwithstanding, there's nobody who could not have a great deal of respect for Dr. King, no serious black man who really understands his history. Stokely, I'd like to ask you, do you regret any of the decisions you made during those early years? Hey man, how's that song go? Uh, there were times when I bit off more than that too, but uh, I stood it all <laughs> right on. Uh, if I, I do it again the same way, exact same way, step by step. I have never, not once regretted anything I have done because I've always felt that what I've done, I've done for the benefit of my people. And I've done it as sincerely as I can do. And I will continue to do that until I die. So uh, I've never, nothing to regret, nothing to regret. Along with the, the foundation that was being laid by Dr. King, uh, with the uh, increasing awareness of the uh, ideologies of Malcolm X and the tremendous um, social impact he was having on our society, you come along with a phrase that's become uh, historical now, black power. And it, it changes the direction of an organization. Uh, did you imagine when you made the speech, which encompassed the words black power, that you would be altering the course of? Uh... Can I tell you a little, little history? Because, you know, uh, history really never gets out. It's really yeah. true, uh, because I think uh, people who are involved in making history don't usually get a chance to really write it. But. Uh, SNCC and SCLC were having internal conflicts. Some of it was spilling out in the public, which I, I've, I've never appreciated and I've never tried, never been a part of and never will be. But uh, one of the points was the question of whether or not we should understand the morality of our own people and begin to build power bases. So thus would leave us to depend only upon our own people or whether we should keep pushing a general morality, basis of morality to try and convert and transform the American society proper. Of course, Dr. King's position was that, yes, you work with black people, you use them as the pivotal point for transforming the total American society. And ours was, no, you've got to build a power base so that whether or not this society transforms or not will not be dependent upon any moral issue, but upon your power relationship to this greater power. And uh, of course, just at the same time, we were having internal conflicts in SNCC, the questions of black nationalism, the questions of self-defense, the questions of the war in Vietnam, whether or not we were to be involved in international, the questions of hookup with Africa, the questions of Israel, and all of these were taking form inside of SNCC, and some of us were consolidating the positions. Yes, we must have a power base. We're not concerned with integration. And people ought to also understand that a lot of times when they write history, they say SNCC was an integrationist movement. They don't really understand anything about SNCC. I know, but I'll, I was one of the original workers with SNCC, and I never went to Mississippi to be able to sit next to anybody white. That was never my objective. A white man was telling me I could not come someplace, and I was going to tell him that he could not tell me where I could or could not go. And even once I knocked him out of the way, even if I never went back to that place, I was going to let him know that you can't limit my life in no way, shape, or form. And I think that's the real thrust of the SNCC people. I knew it for a fact. That's always our discussions. All these places that integrated, I've never been back to. Places where I've been in jail for. It makes no difference. I didn't want to get, I just wanted to tell this white man, hey, you can't tell me where I cannot go. Who are you? You can't ever do that. And if the only tactic we had at that point was nonviolent, we will use that tactic to show you that no man, no man can limit our life. No man, no man. That we will do what we want to do. We'll go where we want to go and we'll act how we want to act. I think that they get confused when they keep making it look as if it's integration. No. It wasn't integration. It wasn't a movement into a larger society. It was, in fact, saying that you cannot limit my movement in any society, in any sphere of that society. And that's very important. Very important. History, you know, never gets written correctly. Anyway, back to black power. When uh, Mr. Meredith got shot, um, I was in Memphis. I was in Memphis. As a matter of fact, I was in the Air Force in Memphis on my way to uh, Tennessee. Cleveland Sellers, who's a, a beautiful brother, 
I mean, and a brother who's been out here for a long time, uh, he called and he said, hey man, look here, uh, Mr. Meredith just got shot and uh, he's in the hospital in Memphis, you should go and see him. So I was the first one to go and see him. Couldn't, couldn't get, he was out, just said hello. In a few minutes, everybody came. Well, Mr. Meredith wanted to march from Memphis to Jackson. Mm -hmm. Now from Memphis to Greenwood, Mississippi was the second congressional district. During the 1964 Mississippi Project, I was a director of that district and I had worked the Delta area for four years. I knew it like the palm of my hand. I knew all the dirt roads. I had been chased on them by white people shooting at me. I slept on the floors of all the sharecroppers in there. I knew all the people. That's how I kept alive. I had to know them. I had to live off of them. And this is where the march was going. And we knew those people. So we called all our people who'd been working together and a young man who plays a very vital role in our our history, a brother who's still out here is a brother by the name of Willie Ricks from Chattanooga, mm -hmm. Tennessee. He's still organizing now. He's in Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, we are beginning to talk now about power. And we decide on the phrase black power. But we can't use the phrase black power just yet. We have many problems. Number one, we have five major civil rights groups in the country. You have the Urban League, the NAACP, SCLC, Dr. King. You have Mr. McKissick, who's now the new chairman of uh, CORE, replacing Mr. Farmer. And you have SC and SNCC. Now, what usually happens is that SNCC and CORE take a radical position on the left. The NAACP and the Urban League take a position on the right, and Dr. King walks down the middle. So we decide, now, if we want to make Dr. King come closer to our position, we must eliminate the two people to the right. Mm -hmm. That's the NAACP and the Urban League. Uh, now, how we eliminated them was just tactically. <laughs> but once they were eliminated from the march, if SNCC and CORE came to the left, Dr. King could not be to the right. And that's exactly how the history, that's the tactic of it. Before we decided to use the phrase black power, we took Willie Ricks and about seven of our workers, and they went ahead of the march. And they went into the plantations, and we said, now, when you get up there, just talk about black power and see the reaction of the people. That's all. And they say, talk about defense, talk about black people should stand up and fight back and just get the reaction. And so while everybody was busy on the march, we had our team out there, and they would come back with fantastic reports. And we were still a little bit afraid now, you know, because we said, hey, if we say it one time, we can't blow it. We've got to hit it right. And as the reports kept coming back, kept coming back, as we went in the march, we kept pushing more and more towards black power, pushing the concept of blackness, black dignity, our, our sense of our own beauty. And we could see the reaction, it was building. And we decided the best place to hit black power would be in Greenwood, Mississippi. Now it just so happened that uh, Greenwood was the base, our base in the Delta. So I had lived in Greenwood in my four years, I'd operated out of it. So I knew Greenwood, Mississippi. I've been inside the jails of Greenwood, Mississippi so many times I couldn't count. I knew the police chief. Mm -hmm. I knew him so well. We knew each other. We just see each other and he'd arrest me. And uh, it just so happened that the night that we were to be in Greenwood, Dr. King had to be somewhere making a speech up north. So Dr. King wouldn't be there. And Mrs. McKissick was sent in another town. So the only one in Greenwood would be the SNCC people. And it just so happened that that day in Greenwood, I was arrested. Then I was released and came right to the mass meeting. And that's when we said, black power. And by that time, we had organized the whole community that once the response was given, they would come back with the response. And it took the electric effect that we thought it would. Dr. King couldn't challenge it or even try and calm it down because he was outside of Mississippi at that point. And Mr. McKissick would have taken the position and he was in, I think, Carroll County, which is adjoining us. So by the time Dr. King came back, black power had already had the effect we wanted to have, and then it was just a matter of spreading it across the country. It didn't take long for it to spread across the country. Hey, not at all, man, because if you're working with the people, you know the people, you speak, you know, when you speak, they will respond. It was, I think, perhaps the greatest moral victory for SNCC uh, of all the other victories. It was, number one, it was something that people could uh, give their own definition to it, sort of like the Bible. You can play around with it, and you can use it, or you can discard it. It's an incredible thing. You have been very fortunate, uh, Stokely. You um, have had the living experience, so you have been a witness to the living Dr. King. And uh, you also have been a student or have been able to communicate with uh, Dr. Kwame and Um How do you size up that experience for yourself? What were you able to take from Dr. Nkrumah? Well, no, Dr. Nkrumah, the great he, he's a, uh, He's great. Uh, he is great. I mean, he is great. Uh, what he taught me, what I learned from him, what I learned by his actions, what he helped direct me to do, things to see, I, I could never begin to repay unless I could take what he taught me 
and give it back to my people as best as I can. And that again, of course, is one of the things that he taught me. Uh, he is fantastic. He's a brilliant mind. He's not just a thinker, but more important, he's an activist. One of his, one of the quotes, I, one of his favorite quotes is what he says time and time again. He says, uh, thought without action is empty. And action without thought is blind. He always says, Stokely, before you act, think. Before he, when you think, act. Don't just think and not act. And don't act without thinking. And uh, through his whole life, that has been manifested. What he has done for the African Revolution, history cannot even begin to record. It will take years to record. And what he's done for the world international revolution, history again, we're yet to recall. The fact that when the coup d'etat occurred against him, he was on his way to Vietnam to speak with Ho Chi Minh to see what pressure the African countries, as weak as we were in relationship to the power bases in the world, were willing to aid the Vietnamese struggle and come to their attention just shows the foresight of this great, great thinker and this great, great activist that we have produced. Uh, Stokely, I'd like to clarify something in my own mind now. Do you feel now, you have to be looking back, that when you were involved in Mississippi and Alabama, when the phrase black power came out, that you were thinking along the lines of a pan-Africanist? Or were you limiting your thoughts at that time to involvement and a social action here in the United States of America without involving the African nations? No, well, now, you must remember that I was born in Trinidad. Yes. And I spent my early childhood in Trinidad, so about 10. And uh, in New York City, where I grew up, I was in constant contact with uh, West Indians, Africans born in the West Indies, if you will. Mm -hmm. And uh, the movement for independence were also building. So there were young brothers my age who were moving back and forth from Trinidad to New York, who I was in constantly contact talking about that. And, as, and they came to me because they said, well, you're involved here. What are you doing? And I kept saying, hey, man, it's the same struggle, you know, so that while at that time there was no way in my mind for the coordination, I didn't see it, I didn't understand it clearly, I felt it, I knew it. Uh, something else about SNCC, in 1964, President Sekou Touré of Guinea invited SNCC to come to Guinea. This is 1964, before people even talking about Africa. We have a meeting and we send a delegation to, to Guinea. President Sekou Touré invites them and give them complete and thorough, I mean, he gave them a protocol treatment for any government in 1964. At the same time, Malcolm X begins to loom. Now, Malcolm X has a great effect upon me because uh, I fell on the influence of Mr. Bayard Rustin in my early life because uh, Mr. Rustin was a socialist. And, uh, I had come out of this New York left-wing thing, but uh, the, the people who were advocating socialism at that time just didn't seem to me to be really hitting the point. And I think one of the problems was my own contradiction recognizing the racial, racial contradictions in the society. That's beautiful. While I understood the class contradictions, and I understand that they're mm -hmm. correct, I have no argument with them, they're precise, they're scientific. The racial contradictions were always there, and these white socialists could not explain it or give it to me. And uh, one time, I think, at a YPSL meeting, which is the Young People's Socialist League, in walks this man, this black man named Bayard Rustin, and he walks in and articulates positions, and I said, oh, wow, I want to be like him when I grow up, you know. <laughs> and uh, he's... He's giving, he's giving us classes now, you know, on socialist thought and developing and working, you know, and moving. And at the same time, there's a man named Malcolm X, whom I know about. And I'm hearing this man. I'm hearing him strong. He's pulling your coat he's pulling, strong. He's pulling yes, me he strong, is. strong. Yes, he I'm is. at Howard University. Yeah. And uh, we're working very hard on Howard. And we decided to invite Malcolm X to speak. And they threatened to kick us out of school. And we worked so well that we invited uh, Malcolm, and they, they couldn't kick us out of school. That's how beautiful we were working mm -hmm. with them. And... The way we bring Brother Malcolm is he used to debate Bayard Rustin. So now I'm under Mr. Rustin now. He's giving me work, but uh, Malcolm's pulling me. So the night of the debate was a deciding factor. Uh, Brother Malcolm spoke. As Brother always. Malcolm spoke. <laughs> and uh, after that night, I said, right on. And from that day on, I followed his thought, his political trend all the way down. Now, when he was in the Nation of Islam, because of religion, I couldn't go that route. But understanding precisely his political thought, I knew that he was giving the correct thought. When he made it to Africa, we followed him closely. And when he came back, he said, Africa must be the base. I said, right, thank you. And from that day on, a few of us got together and said, OK, this is what the brother said. You know, we're working here, but let's begin to extend. And at that time, we pushed an international program for SNCC. SNCC became, SNCC was one of the first organizations, black organizations in the 60s, to really begin to take hard international positions. We were the first one to take a position against the war in Vietnam. Dr. King was not. Dr. King was not. 
We were the first organization on a nationwide basis in this country to take a position, a resistance position to the war in Vietnam. Hell no, we're not going to go, period. No discussion. We were the first black organization in this country, national, to take a position against Israel, aggression against Africa in Egypt, and against the Arab people in general. Oh, and all of these things are building and working. So by now, it's beginning to become clear. In 1967, I'm invited to uh, England to speak to some third world movement. And from there, I go to Cuba. When I get to Cuba, there's a State Department man. I forget his name. I think it's McGlosky. But anyway, when I'm in Cuba, the, I see a press clipping where he says that when I return to America, he's going to pick up my passport. Can I ask you, interrupt here and ask you something? Do you find many vestiges of African culture remaining in Cuba? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. A great deal. It's one, it's one of the strongest areas in as the As much as you would say in Barbados? Much stronger than Barbados. Much stronger than Barbados. The African culture in Cuba is probably one of the strongest in the islands. Even, I would say, stronger than Haiti. Yes, we're very strong. Very okay. strong. Very strong, yes. Yes. Okay. And when I was in Cuba, this uh, McGlosky or whatever his name is, says he's going to take my passport. So I said, well, if you're going to take my passport for going to Cuba, hey, I might as well do it all, you know. So I just opened up the passport and see where I couldn't go. Algeria, Vietnam, Russia, China. I said, right on, I'm going to do them all. <laughs> <laughs> and I did them all except for Korea. That was the only one I didn't make. <laughs> then when I came back, I said, right on, you can have it. <laughs> uh, I think, you know, well, life has really been exciting. You know, I think that the, the black people, we get, we get discouraged because we don't really understand our history. Even in the last few years, there is no reason for us to get discouraged. No reason at all for the, the movement, the rapidity with which we've been moving has been so fantastic and so great that we've been moving so fast that it appears as if we're standing still. But if we examine what we've been doing, we've been moving at a rapid rate. The consciousness of our people have moved at such a rate that it's impossible to comprehend. I mean, just overnight. Just overnight, the fantastic rate in which we've moved as a people. If you were measuring move. the, the movement, and here I have to differentiate and make Africa, Africa, the continent there, and America, America, and you were measuring it on a yardstick, would you see us moving an equidistance each continent? Or do you think maybe we have advanced further ahead than the uh, mass of people in Africa? Do no. they need something in Africa, perhaps like a black power or black is beautiful or a new awareness to, to bring them into? Um... No, I don't think so. I think that, see, I, I see the revolution as one. Irregardless of geographical distance, mm -hmm. I see it as one. Irregardless of geographical boundaries, I still see it as one. And uh, we're the same people. I, you find counter-revolutionary black people in America. You find counter-revolutionary black people in the West Indies. You find counter-revolutionary black people in South America. You find counter-revolutionary black people in Africa. You find revolutionary people in Af black people in Africa, revolutionary black people in Caribbean, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, what it is is that this takes different manifestations, different forms. But if you analyze the forms, you would see it as the same content. For example, we've been moving really cyclic. Uh, the rise of independence in Africa gave us a real spurt. Then came the Caribbean, also adding to the spurt. Then came our movement, and now the circle is going back again with the Africans again picking on the grasp and moving forward again on the continent. Are you rewarded? You said uh, in the uh, film clip that we showed early, which I think will go some way in explaining what you mean by revolution. You said the first thing we must do is stop being ashamed of the fact that we're black. Have you seen any progress in the mass of people accepting the color of their skins in this society or any other society and demanding respect behind them? Oh, but of course, but of course. I mean, that's one of the, I mean, it's very hard for people to really think that a few years ago they were really ashamed to be black. I mean, but it's not so long ago. It's not so long ago. Again, that's one of the, the fastness, this, this is the rate of speed with which we have moved, the swiftness of our movement. I mean, overnight, you just see, Sisters just saying, yes, this is my hair, but it's beautiful. And at first, not believing it's beautiful, but after wearing it and beginning, then they say, oh, but why did I ever fry my hair? Whatever possessed me to do that? I just didn't know my beauty. I didn't know myself. And this is with a rate of speed that's almost overnight. I mean, the, now of course, the, 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 the government circles must try to co-opt this movement. Mm -hmm. But if you know revolution, you know that there must be co-option. So when there's co-option, you do not get disgusted. As a matter of fact, you know you are winning because if you just take the history of black power, now when the, the phrase black power was first uttered, you take a look at Time Magazine, Life Magazine, Newsweek Magazine, the New York Times, the Washington Post. Hey man, I used to read those papers and laugh. 
they were trying, they, the, the entire mass media of America, the entire mass media of America came against SNCC and against black power. They did every possible thing to destroy the concept and were incapable of doing it. And black people had no media. No, no, they didn't even have any black shows. We didn't have souls. We had media though. We had Aretha Franklin and James Brown. I hear you. And, uh, I hear you. I some hear other you. people no, coming along. But I mean controlled media where we could propagate our ideas in a political forum. We didn't even have that. That's true. And without that, we were able to force these very powerful magazines, these powerful medias of imperialism to turn around and try and co-opt black power because they were pushing against it and they said, hey man, we can't stop it. Best we try and do something with it. So they came back and tried to evolve it. But the fact that they did that showed the strength of black people. And once they did that, they didn't know black people weren't about to stop. <laughs> they just came into that vacuum to fill it. Now comes the push for the next stage. Mm -hmm. And now comes the resistance again because in revolution, they've got to be pushing and they're pushing against you as force, it's science. You push, they stop, but you keep pushing, there's a break. Then you come again, there's another wall. You amass your strength, you push again, and you break. And but we're reaching that stage. In defining that stress uh, to be a true uh, revolutionary, uh, it would be best if we defined it ourselves. But unfortunately, in this country, a lot of other people have to define what is the stress situation for us. We're too busy trying to pay the rent and have a telephone or, or eat. No, and no, we, we, we define it now. We define it. It doesn't get interpreted. Mm -hmm. The way, because we, we again don't control the mass media, but we do define it. Now their attempt, the attempt of the media, the job of the media is to confuse our people. The job of this media, one seeing that it could no longer hold back black power, they decide to try a new tactic. Their tactic was okay, accept it, but now confuse it. And you understand that in this attempt, there's no need to fight that. Continue your organizing because there will come a stage when this confusion will be just come antithetical to itself because people will just be going around circles saying, that's not black power. Now, let me give you an example. Today, people buy black, black people buy black, but they're sold Negro. You know, mm -hmm. if you, they say black movie, hey, they come running. But when they go, it's not a black movie, it's a Negro movie. You know, sex and dope, nonsense, nothing, nothingness. You know, black music, there's no black music, it's negative songs. But in order to sell, they have to say black. So the masses want to buy black, they're being sold Negro. So any, any people who really understand this say, okay, the masses want to buy black, let's sell them black. And we're going to sell them black. We're going to sell them the blackest of all, the African Revolution. And the masses is going to buy it. They're going to buy it. <laughs> Will we be able to make a contribution to that? Or do we have to evolve to some stage where we can reach out and touch on an equal basis and accept also on an equal basis uh, the uh, brothers and sisters on the continent of Africa? No, again, we're the same people. And we always see it as the same struggle. If I am in Tanzania, on the east coast of Africa, and I am in a village in Tanzania, and the people of Tanzania are digging a ditch to put down pipe so they can have running water into that village. I dig that ditch. I dig it as best as I can dig it, and dig it as fast as I can dig it, and as most effectively as I can dig it, because I know that by digging this ditch, I contribute to the African Revolution. I contribute to the African Revolution. If I'm in Trinidad, and there's an underground newspaper condemning a neo-colonialist government. I work with that paper, knowing that this contribution is part of the African revolution. If I am in New York City and black people are fighting for control of community schools, I work with that. I try to get that because I know this is an aid to the African revolution. If I am in Guinea and I'm living in Guinea and Portuguese fascists with NATO invade my country, I get with a gun and fight them. And I know by fighting and wiping them out, I am contributing to the African Revolution. We must see it as a total picture, knowing that wherever we contribute to the benefit of our people, we are contributing to our overall struggle. And until we begin to view it that way, the white boy will always be able to divide our struggle. But what about our Christian following, our, our Christian discipline? Is it a limiting factor? And are the people, our brothers and sisters on the continent, as aware of how involved we are with being Christians? That's well, now you see we're the same people and uh, the same thing he did to us here in America is the same thing he did to the brothers on the continent. Uh, I think sometimes he did much stronger because Africa is our land. And uh, in order to confuse us on our own land, he has to work a lot harder. This is not our land, we know that. It's the land of the red man. And uh, so the confusion here is a lot easier, but it's much harder if I'm in my own house for you to come and convince me that it's not my house and subject me inside my own house than if I'm in somebody else's house and you come in there and treat me badly. So that 
Christianity now has positive and negative factors. What we have to do is to take the positive factors from it and move with it and leave the negative factors, as is the case with uh, all religions and most things. The religion of Islam also has a great effect on our people. It has its positive and negative aspects. Both of these religions are foreign religions. They're alien religions to Africa. They're not the, uh, they don't come from within Africa. So that the effects, or in many cases now, uh, religion has always been used really as a political tool to, uh, to, subju to subjugate us, to subjugate us, to keep us victim victimized. Uh, the Christian religion, of course, by preaching this uh, look up in the sky and forget the ground around you. And uh, while we look up in the sky, we're being raped, our riches are being stolen, etc., etc. Islam also has its aspects of fatalism. And what we must do is to convince the African man of his inner dignity and let him know that it is man, man, who is able to transform. It is man without any limitations placed upon him. Once he recognizes his creative genius who can transform any situation and mold it the way he wants to mold it. It is man and man alone. And no force is dependent upon him except he himself. What he can do in order to transform his own condition. Thus, we don't need any crutches. We need none. I find brothers all the time who tell me that, uh, yeah, well, brother, the spirit's going to take care of uh, the white man. I said, well, look here, brother, this white, white man ain't did none to the spirits. I don't want the spirits messing with him. Hey, he belongs to me, <laughs> you know, so I don't need no crutch. <laughs> Stuck there, there are going to be a lot of questions uh, that um, a lot of people, I'm certain, are going to need you to answer. And I'd like to say that if you'd like to address any question to Brother Carmichael, you can simply write us here at Seoul. The address is Seoul. 304 West 58th Street, New York 10019. I repeat that address, it is Seoul. 304 West 58th Street, New York 10019. And Stokely, I'd like to move now to, um, you're back on these shores and you are founding, I don't know the correct word, uh, a new party. Should we call it a party or an organization? No, it's a party. It's the All African People's Revolutionary Party. I'm not founding it. Uh, a few years ago, many of us who recognized the contradictions in the United States said, now what we have to do is to just come back a little, sit back, analyze a little bit more, and organize quietly. As we move around, we'll go to all the conferences that people have. We will not call these conferences, we will not take active part in them in sponsoring them, but we will always be there supporting them. And as we move around, we will look around for the most serious people inside of these conferences, people who we think are really serious and are really committed and understand this struggle because uh, uh, the media, again, tries to make the struggle appear as if, you know, we can get a victory tomorrow. You know, we can't get a victory tomorrow. My grandchild is going to be fighting. I understand that. I understand that. One thing that... Uh, Osagifo said to me once was that I was very impatient one time. I wanted to do something. And he said, but why are you so impatient? I said, oh, sir, but I'm not impatient. He said, yes, you are. I said, but sir, I, I see my people suffering. I want to do something. He says, uh, do you know that all impatience is selfishness? I said, no, sir. <laughs> he said, yes, all impatience is selfishness and egotism. I said, no, sir, uh, I'm patient, but my people are suffering. He said, uh, do you know that the African revolution will triumph? I said, but of course I do. He said, oh, you just want to be the one to bring it out. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> so I understand that I don't have to be impatient. If all this generation, my generation can do is to move from here to here, let's do that perfectly. Let's lay a perfect foundation so that the children who come after us will be able to carry on the struggle that much further. We're not going to win this struggle today. We're not going to win it tomorrow. This is a struggle. This is a long struggle. We're fighting, the, we're fighting a struggle that has been taking place for 500 years and even way beyond that. We're just a small part of that struggle, a very small part. And we cannot see ourselves as the most important part. What, our generation is no more important than my father's generation, which is no more important than my grandfather's generation. And all these generations have struggled and waged fierce struggles. I mean, anytime people get real smart and say, we're not going anywhere, say, hey, man, think about your grandfather. He was a slave. Mm -hmm. White boy was whooping him every day. Now look where you are. See how we're moving. Don't get upset. Let's just take our time, take our patience, understand that we have to find what our mission is, what the mission of this generation is, and do that, and do it perfect, properly, correctly, thoroughly, and completely, and then the other's gonna take care of the rest. Let's leave some for the children. Dr. You, you're so uh, kind of beautifully uh, optimistic, and you Scientifically. Also, scientifically. Because I know we're gonna win. Oh, <laughs> but I think also living in West Africa might have had some influence. No Did you find any um, 
Is there anyone who's been a great influence on you in, of course, in Africa? Of course, uh, Osaji Fo and President Sekou Toure. President Sekou Toure is a beautiful black man. He's a beautiful African. He, he, he never compromises. He's uncompromising about the dignity of Africa. And he carries with his very <coughs> presence the dignity and the worth of Africa the way that, hey, man, when he just walks, you, you see Africa walking. And I've watched him. I've watched him work. He's fantastic. I've watched his patience. You know, I learned, now, I learned a lot from Dr. Nkrumah on patience, but I've watched patience tactically at work with President Sekou Toure. I have watched patience tactically at work with President Sekou Toure. And I've watched him. Hit a stumbling block here, hit a stumbling block there, hit a stumbling block there. And when you see him and he's just hit a stumbling block, hey, he said, we just hit a stumbling block. Said, yes, mm -hmm. sir. He said, that means we're working much harder because they're throwing more blocks in our way. Let's keep pushing. Let's keep pushing. Let's keep pushing. He's had a fantastic effect upon me. Of course, the masses of Guinea themselves, uh, the, the political organization of Guinea, the way that the country is woven together with a clear political ideology that unifies the masses. In Guinea, everybody is armed. We're all armed. The government gives us all guns. I have guns all in my house in Guinea, which the government has given me. And the government has trained me how to use it. They train everybody how to use these guns. And while the entire population of Guinea is armed, we've never had one armed robbery. Not mm -hmm. a one. Not a one. Because we have a clear political ideology which has been given to us by the party of Guinea under the direction of Sekou Toure. And uh, I've, I've seen all of these things. I've participated in them. Well, I went to Africa. I didn't go to Africa as a tourist. You know, many, many brothers here go to Africa for different reasons. Mm -hmm. Some go for profit. Some go for cultural exposure. Some go for tourism. I went for the revolution, so I went to Guinea. I went where I thought the revolution was really taking form. I went to Guinea. And being able there, once I got to Guinea, I didn't say, I'm an Afro-American. Hey, no, I I'm an African. Guinea is my home. Now, what are we doing? I've come to help put home in order. Now you tell me, what are we doing? We're building ditches in Dalaba? Fine, I'll do that. We're teaching school here? I can do that. I'll do that. We're running political workshops here? I can help? I'll do that. We're doing military training here? I can help? I'll do that. Whatever you're doing, I'm doing because this is my home. This is my home. And I have something to say about how it's done. You are my brothers. I am your brother. We are one. We've been separated. We had nothing to do with that separation except at a time when our own society had its own internal divisions and these internal divisions were manipulated by outside forces, but we're one. So once I am in Guinea, once I'm in Trinidad, wherever I am, I become immersed in that total African community there and become involved in whatever work they're doing, knowing that I am a part of it. But again, this depends upon our own political ideology. Once we know that we are Africans, that Africa is our home, that Africans are our brothers and sisters, then we'll begin to work better. This will help clear up a lot of the crime that we have in our community, because we have to talk about these problems, problems of crime. I would hate us to be seductive here, though, but do you think uh, any African in this country could make the same decision to go to a nation in Africa and be as accepted and as rewarded for his services as you were? Yes, sir. We have them in Guinea right now. Yes, sir. Not only in Guinea, we have some in Tanzania. We have some in Nigeria. We have them all over. Everywhere on the continent I've been, practically every country, there are brothers and sisters who are from the States or from the Caribbean or from South America who are living on the continent and are a part of that continent. And they'll tell you, this is my home. I was born mm -hmm. in Brazil. This is my home. I was born in Texas. This is my home. I was born in Jamaica. And this is what we're doing here. And this is my job. And this is how I'm helping. And I know that by doing this, I'm helping Jamaica. I know that by helping build Tanzania, I'm helping Texas. Black what people is the language of Guinea? The, the official language is French, the official mm -hmm. language. The national language, of course, you have Fula, you have Malinki, you have Susu, and you have about five others, Gursi, etc., etc. Uh, is Swahili spoken in Guinea? No, no. Swahili is found on the eastern coasts of Africa. Swahili would be in Tanzania, in Kenya, and I think Uganda. But uh, in Guinea, there are several languages, eight of them. Were you able to communicate and, and move about uh, with using English as, as your only language? Yes, at first, you know, one of the beautiful things is that uh, without being able to speak, I was forced to communicate. And mm -hmm. that was very beautiful because uh, when having to communicate with someone who doesn't speak, you have to take an effort. And it's the effort that they take on trying to make you understand. And, uh, for example, when we reached just discussing political discussions in my early days in Guinea, I'm not speaking French, I'm not speaking Fula. 
just English and they're speaking French and just the two of us trying to communicate or a group of us trying to communicate, one of the most beautiful and rewarding experiences that made me see that language difficult, language differences is not a, are not a barrier to our unity. In fact, they can be a positive attribute because they really force us to reach out for mm -hmm. each other. And by being forced to reach out for each other, we transcend the, the language barriers. And uh, it was really a beautiful, it's a beautiful experience. During what was, uh, well, I'm going to call it a, a transitory period for you. Uh, I have to offer a compliment to someone who stood beside you. And uh, I mean, I have to say that Miriam McCabe, uh, I uh, send her a bouquet of roses and love and all the good vibrations ever. She's. Um, a compliment to African womanhood. She and is. she has been thank a great you. and a dignified compliment to you. I thank you. I uh, think so. She's been, she's strong now. She's real strong. What is the most significant thing, Stokely, for the youth, the black youth, to, to concentrate on in your mind, in your opinion, in order to press forward? They must have a clear understanding of our history, our struggle, and where it's going. They must have. That is the major thing because your history if interpreted to you correctly, is your motivating force. It is your motivating force. It is that which tells you what you can do. And once you know what you have done, you know what you can do. Now, our history has always been interpreted to us for us by the white boy, always interpreted, so that our students don't even have a motivating force. They go to, that's why they drop out of school. And the fight for black studies, when these people talk about black science, that's not the fight. Black studies is only for one thing, to motivate black students to stand up and understand that there is nothing they cannot do for their people once they decide they can do it. And that's all this fight is about at this point. We must motivate our students to let them know, hey, listen, young brother, don't drop out of school. You in school, not for yourself, but for your people. Even if you don't want to be there, be there for your people. Understand? Just be there for your people. So get whatever you can get for your people. You go into science, you're in Harvard, you're in the business school at Harvard, you're in Harvard, you're in medical school, get it all! Come out the top student up there and bring it back and give it to your people. Don't get up there and talk about it's irrelevant. If it's irrelevant, don't go. But once you're up there, get it all. Be the top in the class, Jim. Be the top. Get it all. Then bring it back. Give it to your people because they need it. They need it desperately. And you're there because of your people. All of these black programs on these colleges are a result of the pressure of the masses. When the masses started to rebel in the street, he had to do something quick. And he started opening up all these programs. And so all those students who are in those programs are in those programs as a result of the blood of their brothers and sisters shed in the streets of Watts, Washington, Detroit, and Newark. And they have a responsibility, a blood responsibility, if you will, to give back to their people the opportunities that their people made available for them. They must take those opportunities and give them back to their people. And that's the, the motivating force that we must give to us. Again, it is a correct interpretation of our history to let them know, hey, brother, you know Afro-American, ain't no such thing, you're an African. And your society, your history don't begin 400 years. Your history begins millions and millions and millions and millions of years ago. While the white boy was in the caves, your fathers were building pyramids. The Leaning Tower of Pizza is falling. The Eiffel Tower is falling. The pyramids are standing strong. You built them, brother. Get up and work. You're scientific people. Build. Build for your people. Don't sit down. There is nothing, nothing we cannot do. All we got to do, as the Honorable Marcus Garvey said, is get up and do it. We're a mighty race. Up now, you mighty race. And that's what we must give to our youth. That's what we must give to them. I, uh... <laughs> You've gotten a lot of power. <laughs> hey, it's black people. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. You've come back strong. <laughs> well, I should hope so. I'm four years older. I got four years more knowledgeable four years more experience, and I'm four years more determined. There's nothing can stop us. I know that, nothing. If you just watch the development of our movement, it's clear scientific planning, the moves that we make, there's nothing can stop us. The, the, the America has tried to divide all the, the organizations in our societies over the last four years. They've done it through different tricks, through repression, through poverty money, through publicity to counter-revolutionary elements in our community, and through vicious propaganda against the true revolutionary elements in our community, thus hoping to divide and confuse our community. And these organizations now, which are divided and fighting each other, have a responsibility to the masses of their people to come together. Because when the masses look up to these organizations and see them fighting each other, they become demobilized. And we must inspire them. These organizations must now come together. Our party has been trying to bring them together. We keep asking them, won't you sit down, let us among ourselves talk together? In the Jewish community, all of the Jewish organizations sit down and have their own umbrella. 
in the Irish community, in the Italian community. Only in our community do we find black leaders who don't want to sit down with other black leaders and discuss their problems. We know what the problem is. It's not the black community, it's from the outside. But the masses of people are now going to put pressure on the leaders to force them to unite because we are a people who when there is stress and strain, we come together. We've always proven that if you study our history, you see whenever there's stress and strain, we come together. And there's a period of stress and strain coming in this country. And what he's trying to do is to keep us apart before we begin to come together. And we must consciously fight that. We must come together. We must, we must form united fronts all over this country so that when he hits one, boom, he got to hit all. He got to hit all. He's got to hit all. And the only way we can do that is by beginning to unite our people and bring them together, starting with the leadership so they can set an atmosphere that will inspire the masses to move forward, to unite with each other. Stokely, um, time's up. And, uh, so soon? <laughs> time's probably up for Seoul anyway. We probably won't be here much longer. But it's been beautiful. The people out there responded well. Why I am that? privileged and honored. You know why it is, but uh, well, let's see, not but, deal with that. Th isn't but see, time. if our community was organized, that would that be? I don't know. Maybe it is a uh, evolutionary process that's necessary. But I'm very proud to have had this conversation with you. It's done a lot. And uh, tonight, I hope that um, whoever's listening has learned something. And it's been beautiful. We will find a way to communicate and get our message through. Hey, even by drums. We did a long time All ago. All right. And I <laughs> don't cause no dime. tonight's <laughs> program. I want to make a dedication of it to Lynn and H. Rap Brown and to Mae Jackson. I think. You know, they're deep. They're there. beautiful people. They're they beautiful. Are. Sister Jackson, she's been out here a long time. <laughs> right on. Long time. Yeah. All the way down on the corner of Harlem Street. Brother Rap Brown, hey, man. For what he has done for us, if he doesn't do another thing, we have to support him. Because when he carried the ball, I watched him, and he carried it like an arrogant young warrior. He never compromised. He watched him all the time, eyes straight ahead, and walked with it. And we must support him. They're all standing tall still. Hey, they can't stop. They're Africans. They're beautiful people. Oh, stuff. They <laughs> thank you very much. It's been beautiful. My pleasure. Yeah. I want to talk to black people across this country.